Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Well, what was a regular routine day at work for Kennedy Folkadol changed in the blink of an eye? An accident with a miter saw severed Kennedy's left hand completely. But thanks to his own quick thinking and Mayo Clinic being just a helicopter right away, this tragic accident has a happy ending, which is great because he is here to share his story. Kennedy Folkadol and his surgeon, Dr. David Dennison, welcome to the program, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, nice to have you guys with us. So, Kennedy, if you don't mind, let's let's go back to that day and what you remember about it and what your job was and, and how this accident happened. Okay, so we started off the day. Um, we did a little overpass. We had to rip off the shingles and place some back down, and then we um, followed into town where we were remodeling above a coffee shop. So you are working in construction? Yes, ma'am. And it, on break from college, were you in college, or what were you doing? Yep, I was uh, home for the summer. Okay. Just working with um, a company in town. Making um, money for college. Yep, exactly. In Iowa, by the way. <laughs> Are you, you from Iowa? Yes. <laughs> oh, he's, he's got a future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where were you in Iowa? So we were in Decorah, Iowa. In Decorah, okay. Um, right on Water Street, working above the Java Johns um, there in town. They, Is this a job you'd had before, or had you been in construction before? Yeah, I'd worked construction ever since I was a sophomore in high school. So okay. it was something I did every summer um, just to make a little extra money, and I always enjoyed you know long days and working hard. So you got distracted by the delicious coffee smell at Java John's? <laughs> Is that what happened? Well, when we got there, we actually they treated us to some donuts and uh, some refreshments, so I was uh, feeling pretty, pretty energized. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened? Um, we were cutting baseboard trim, and I was cutting it and then having this kid place it in the positions where it needed to go. He was nailing it. And as I was going through this board, there was a knot, I believe, that it jumped forward. And I believed it caught onto my sleeve of my long sleeve shirt and just kind of ripped it in so fast that there was no way I could have done anything about it. And it cut your hand right off? Yep. It, it was. We actually replaced the blade a week before. Um, just because it was, you know, a lot of summer work coming up and it was uh, needed so it, to be it replaced. Was, it was yeah. sharp. It was sharp. Yeah, it was, it was very fresh. And this was a miter saw? Fresh. Table yep. table saw? Yep, or? chop saw, miter saw, 12-inch blade. And you, I know this because <laughs> I read the prep on this interview, you somehow had the presence of mind to tie it off with your shirt on your own. No one else did that for you? Yeah, it was a bit uh, out of desperate, I guess you could say. I was kind of freaking out, um, and the blood was spraying everywhere, and I didn't want to, you know, ruin all the nice cabinets and stuff we had just put in. So, I quickly wrapped it and um, tried to. Well, you only had one hand. How did you? How did you wrap it? Somehow, I got that shirt oh, off. Oh, you wrapped just wrapped it around with one yeah, hand. Yeah, yeah. I got the shirt off and then just kind of tightly. I don't really remember how I did it. I just did it so quick. I was just trying to stop the bleeding and kind of control it. Um, a little bit and I ran in and this this kid that I was working with he was actually a little older than me he was not doing well he started to freak out he fainted or he didn't faint thank God because I don't know what I would have done with the with him Um, what did you have (laughs) what did you have him do I told him to go downstairs and get some ice and then I didn't have my phone on me I left it in my boss's truck that day and he had ran the dump trailer to empty it and bring it back so we could refill it with all the stuff we uh, threw off the yeah, took mm-hmm. out yeah, of the building. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, he called the ambulance and told him what had happened and then went down to the coffee shop to get ice. But in the event of trying not to make it such a big deal, he came up with a plastic cup of ice instead of a large bag, which was, you know. He thought you had a little bruise or. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what he was. a slight emergency upstairs and I could use a little ice? <laughs> yeah. So he brought this cup up and I was like, okay, that, well, we can make that work. So I kind of just put the hand, you know, down in it with the blood, um, the bloody area directly on the ice, hoping that that might preserve it a little better. So how did you know that might be the right thing to do? You know, I don't know if it was a movie I saw when I was younger or if it was God just clicking the information into my head or what, but it something clicked, and I I figured that was the best thing to do with the situation at hand. And um, Did you get... Did you see what he did there, the situation at hand? <laughs> what a guy. Yeah, I didn't... <laughs> did, <laughs> did you t- get a ride in the helicopter in Mayo 1? So, yeah, I did eventually. Um, they ambulanced me to the hospital, 
And they were actually going to send me to lacrosse because my mom was working there at the time. And we thought, you know, insurance reasons, that's probably the best place to go. But luckily, one of the nurses who was there knew that they didn't have the ability to do that. And, it, you know, they would end up sending me to Mayo anyway. So we kind of uh, shortened the trip. Instead of going all the way to lacrosse, they just called Mayo and had them come down to Decor and pick me up. Wow. In the helicopter. Yep. You, you remember all this. Yep. So um, I'm sure that there was still some bleeding, even with your shirt as a tourniquet on your forearm, Yeah, right? it, was, it was, I mean, yeah. So how did you ultimately get it stopped? I mean, because there's two <coughs> big arteries down there. We'll learn more from Dr. Dennison. Mm-hmm. But there, the blood must have been spurting out clear over to the baseboard, wasn't it? So there was a, a local doctor walking by the street. His name was Dr. Heine. And... <laughs> Saved your hiney. Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is terrible. My okay, boss. Now I'm going to go with God. Just the one. Who, I mean, if there's a doctor walking by when this happens, can, we can edit. This. <laughs> <laughs> so, my boss um, saw him, and it, that was his doctor. So he was like, "Yo, I need you to come up here and try help." And he comes up, and he put his fingers in the arteries to stop the bleeding, and held him there until the paramedics came with oh. the tri- the legitimate tourniquet, you know, strap mm-hmm. or whatever. So it was a pretty big deal for him to do that. I mean, he was just talking to me like, oh, what are your, what are your siblings doing? How's your dad? How's your mom? You know, <laughs> trying to get my mind off sure. it, of course. But um, I think that was a big, big part to play in it. Dr. Dennison, what happened when Kennedy arrived? You were working that day or did you get called in or what happened? Uh, yeah, we were here on call that beginning of the week. I think it was a Friday. Um, but at the beginning of the weekend Saturday. or so, was it Saturday? Saturday. Mm-hmm. It was over a weekend on call with, um, um, and we actually happened to be the weekend we were doing a risk course here, one of our professional uh, courses we do, and we were on call and got the the uh, notification from our triage center that there's a young man who had a hand that was uh, cut off and was on their way up, uh, on his way up to uh, Mayo. I think we found out probably when you were on your way up. I don't think it was before that, mm-hmm. whether we had a question about any place else to go. And they did make a good call because the cross probably wouldn't be able to do it there. Um, and uh, fortunately, they that was the, the main thing. You were there probably before we left from here to go down to the hospital. Mm-hmm. I honestly don't remember much of our discussion when I met you that day because it was probably pretty quick. I think I probably said, well, we're going to do what we can do. And we uh, took off with your hand at the time, which had been nicely prepared by everybody who picked it up on ice, if we put it in a bag on some wet saline around it in the bag and then on ice, kind of close to what you started with. Mm-hmm. Did, they, did they do that at the Decorah Hospital, or did the paramedics do that one, or do you remember? When the paramedics came to pick me up, they had a large bag that they were putting it in, and, you know, the paramedic, he, I felt kind of bad for him because he was a little startled by it. And I don't know if the hand was trying to run away on him or what, but it, he couldn't get it in the bag. And I was just sitting there kind of watching, like, hey, be careful with that thing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we, may, we may need that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> please, bit, please treat it gently. They, they got it in the bag, and, and then I would assume they eventually put some saline on it because that helps preserve it a little more. And then, So how long did it take you to decide that this was a reattachable hand? So that was one of the uh, good things about this story was that um, Kennedy had gotten to us relatively quickly within a, probably a few hours, I would say. Uh, with any kind of muscle in the hand or any part of uh, consideration for replantation, the uh, ischemia time really does matter if there's muscle in the part. So in the hand, there's not that much muscle, but he had gotten to us, I think, probably around three hours, maybe a little bit more from the time of the injury, and the hand had been well-preserved in a wrapped in saline and plastic on ice. So it gave us a little bit, uh, some confidence in the amount of time that we had to get started. So there was no question in your mind that this is something that you should go with because sometimes it's it's iffy whether or not it's the Absolutely, right thing to yeah. do. Right? The the um, the other thing here is just that uh, the saw injury was very sharp and it was a very narrow zone of injury, so we didn't have a large loss of tissue on either side. So it was something where we could find two ends and put back together basically yeah well you're gonna have to tell us how you did that <laughs> we're talking about a uh, accident that severed kennedy Folkadol's hand requiring a hand replant which was performed by mayo clinic orthopedic surgeon dr david dennison time for a short break when we come back we'll hear more about kennedy's road to recovery
Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. We are back with Mayo Clinic orthopedic surgeon, Dr. David Dennison, and his patient, Kennedy Folkadol. Now, Dr. Dennison, how long ago was this, by the way? Just, uh, just about three years now. Three years ago. And how old are you now, Kennedy? 22. All right. Dr. Dennison was able to reattach Kennedy's hand after a work accident. So we want to hear about the surgery. You, you have made the decision that you should reattach this hand. By the way, are you right or left-handed? Thankfully, right. Okay, and this was your left hand. Yes, sir. All right, there's one good thing so far. <laughs> so, Dr. Denison, you made the, you evaluated Kennedy. Uh, you, uh, the hand was, was on ice, um, and you made the decision to go to the OR. Yes, Tom. Um, fortunately, again, uh, Kennedy got there relatively quickly within a couple of hours from his injury, and the, his hand was um, prepared nicely from the site of the uh, injury. And that's important? Very important to make sure that it can help preserve the viability of any muscle in particular that could be in the hand as opposed to a finger or thumb. In any case, we would keep any part in moist saline, gauze, plastic bag, and then on ice. And it came, uh, fortunately, it was uh, doing a good job like that, staying cool while we were able to assess the hand and look for parts that we could replant. And uh, the other thing was that Kennedy did a great job too, is that with the site of the accident, uh, Bleeding control is number one, so he did a good job of getting a tourniquet on there, and there are other ways to do that, but elevation and a tourniquet control was uh, fortunately kept him thinking and getting him to the next step in his care. You say there are other ways to do that, but not too many of us are carrying around a tourniquet in our pocket. No, yeah. not too many, but um, there has been a bit of a, a push, I think, in the even on things like Facebook to see patients talk or people talking about you know, having a tourniquet somewhere just almost like having a defibrillator available or mm. something like that because those injuries do occur and um, it's probably not a bad idea to at least think about it and maybe have one at the cabin or on the boat or something just in case. Certainly any place where there is a saw or yeah, or yeah. Work, workplace for sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or a coffee shop. Oh boy. <laughs> All right. Hopefully so not. how long did that surgery take from beginning to end? Oh, you know, um, I haven't thought about that in a while. It's probably, uh, I'm guessing, Probably in between six to nine hours, maybe a little longer. I don't remember exactly. What's the main? Uh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, but it's not something that you do every day. So how you must have some sort of training that kicks in. Oh yeah, the last time we reattached. Yeah, um, yeah we, it does happen. We're um, basically the main thing is to get uh, make sure the patient's okay, get them upstairs, see if there are if it's doable, if there's structures on each side that we can reattach. And then also timing, trying to get some blood flow back into the into the hand so that it all the muscles and the nerves and things can hopefully re recover. Now you you're not by yourself. I mean, you have absolutely probably not. a fellow there. No, absolutely and, not. Uh, and did some another hand surgeon come in to help you so you could take a little break? Uh, not exactly, but we had a, a great team that day. Of course, just like always here at Mayo, from everybody in the ER, we had several residents, chief residents, hand fellows that all participated. Um, in particular, Dr. Ali Zapano was the fellow at the time, and Ali and I did most of the work together that day. So tell us the process. What do you fix first? How, how do you uh, briefly push sure. this thing back on? Well, just kind of get things cleaned up and see where we can get bone back to bone and make sure that the nerves will reach each other, hopefully. And so we do bone first, get stability, then blood flow, and then kind of repair all the other structures, the tendons and and nerves to follow. So it really was lucky, not only that Kennedy is right-handed, but it really was lucky that it was a brand new blade that very cleanly cut his hand off. Uh, well, probably. <laughs> if you have to have it, have it. But yeah. yeah, it was the zone of injury being narrow was clearly helpful, huh. like as opposed to if it was an agricultural injury mm -hmm. or something where more of the tissue was crushed or things. So. Um, Tell us about the rehabilitation, Kennedy. What what was that like for you? Um, I had nine months of uh, PT. Um, Do you so you probably could not feel your hand uh, immediately after the surgery, right? I could move my fingers a little bit. Okay, but everything was pretty tight, pretty uh, pretty numb, traumatized. You know, the whole area was just a little difficult to move, and yeah, pretty numb. So the nerves, even though they have been sewn back together, it takes a while for the sensation to come back and the motor function to come back. Sure, right? sure. About an inch a month in general. So um, the injury is traumatizing. What was this like emotionally? Um, for me, I really enjoyed construction, and I, you know, I really enjoyed working using two hands. So 
when it initially happened, I was like, wow, like there goes everything I've ever worked for kind of type stuff. But at the same time, um, I was lucky enough to have Mr. Dennison do a great job and mm -hmm. I figured there was potential. So <laughs> I went and got it. Maybe you could work in construction again. Is that what you're still doing? Um, no, I'm not. <laughs> I have uh, kind of altered my my uh, working to the office scene. Okay. I thought you were going to tell me you're going into medicine, and I was going to yeah. say, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to use my brain a little more. Um, I got a finance degree, so working for an investment firm now. Just and a lot of uh, talking and stuff like that. You have had another surgery. How many surgeries total? Did you say three mm -hmm. surgeries? Yep. What, tell us about the last one. Um, the last one was to shorten my ulnar bone because I was having a little bit of pain on the outside there. And in the rush of Dr. Denison putting it back on, he... We um, we adjust when we had <laughs> yeah, to. Yeah, he's better at explaining. Well, just quickly, we had to when we had to shorten things so the nerves would work. We were uh, very interested in getting the blood supply to the hand, and the ulna looked okay. And as it turned out, it was just a little bit long, bothered him a little bit, so we fixed that. So there are two bones in the in the forearm. The bigger one is the radius, and the smaller one is the is the ulna. And it turned out that you shortened the forearm a little bit so that the nerves you could repair the nerves easier. Correct. And but it, the ulna ended up being slightly too long. Just a little. You long. missed it by a couple of millimeters. We thought, well, what's the chance that that's going to bother him? And sure enough, it did. Yeah. So that was the last surgery is to shorten the ulna a little bit, and then. Uh, once you do that, then you put a plate on it, and then it will heal back together. It will heal. It took a little bit longer, but it's healed. Now, um, there are some of us that are watching, some people who are watching this on YouTube, and so show, show us what sort of function you have in your hand now. Um, I can do quite a bit of movement. Um, so you can pretty much uh, straighten your fingers out, all the way up. Yep, out. singling out the fing fingers is a little difficult because of the scar tissue and the binding and stuff that's in there, but... You know, I could pick up this glass and shake your hand. And yeah. When you came in, I couldn't tell. I just initially went, wait a minute, which hand? I mean, it looks, you have to you have to look to see that your hand mm -hmm. has that scar I there. I mean, the scar is, you know, definitely there, yeah. and you can tell the difference, but... Um, so for f folks who are listening on the radio and not watching on YouTube, it's just right above where your watch would be on your left hand. I actually wear a watch sometimes... To kind of hide it, you know, I mean, if, if I'm at a formal gathering or sure. something like that. Did it help that it did not go through the wrist and that it really was um, not at a joint? It did. It made, it was actually, um, number one, faster to get it back on there and actually gave us some other ability to stabilize it with a plate because there was just enough bone to get a couple of screws in to hold it together, which really did help. Pretty. This was pretty much an ideal circumstance uh, for a hand transplant, a hand replant, right? I think so. I think if you had to have this happen and you could be young, healthy, and be close to the wrist and enough to get it back on in a relatively quick time, have the transportation to get here and everything else in a positive attitude, it's it's worked out, I think, reasonably well for, for Kennedy. So. All things considered, are you happy with the result? Maybe? Yeah, very happy. I mean, um, yeah, all things considered, I'm, I'm lucky to have a hand in, in general. No question you know. about that. Did you get your coffee at Java Joe's, or <laughs> are you still in? <laughs> yeah, I, w I went there um, a couple <laughs> couple months after, and I I know the owners, and they they actually bought me free coffee. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> that's yeah. good. And a cup of ice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, we've been hearing the story of surgery to reattach Kennedy Folkadol's hand and his road to recovery. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Dennison and Kennedy. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.